right. I have one announcement tonight, or two. Actually, we are going to have men's prayer breakfast this month. That's going to be on the, let me see, 11, 12, on the 19th. Okay, so we will start that up again this week, uh, or next week. So we'll see. I may have, if I've get, got a couple of speakers, we're going to do something maybe a little different. But uh, I'd like to have uh, Lacey Hull, who's running for the state Republican uh, representative position in this district. Vital race. Vital race. It is, um, uh, the Democrats think that they can flip it because uh, Dwayne Bohack won it by only... 47 votes the last time, but he kind of irritated some local Spring Branch people over some, I'm not even sure what it was, but that was probably why. But uh, that has to be uh, taken care of. And then I'm thinking about getting uh, one or two other people, and we'll have a couple of people who can come and speak. So we'll figure out how to handle that and announce that before we get there. Also, uh, I want to announce that we have a few brochures out there for the Pre-Trib Rapture Conference. The Pre-Trib Rapture will conference. The Pre-Trib Rapture may or may not take place this year, but the conference is going to take place December 7th through the 9th. And this is, um, and it will take place. We will be there in person simply because the way the contract was written last year. Who knew in December what the circumstances were going to be with all of this? And it will cost pre-trib just, you know, an inordinate amount of money if, if we cancel. So if the hotel cancels, which I doubt, because they'll make an inordinate amount of money if things are not good and they'll leave it up to us to not cancel. So uh, we're going to have to do that. We'll have the banquet on Monday night. The speaker is Dr. Erwin Lutzer, who's the pastor emeritus of the uh, Moody Church, where he was a senior pastor for 36 years. And he has written quite a bit of outstanding uh, books over the years. And so I'm, I'm really looking forward to meeting him and also uh, hearing him. But there are a number of, uh, of good speakers who are going to be there this, this year talking about a number of different uh, uh, issues related to the study of eschatology as, and dispensationalism, primarily uh, focus on dispensationalism with a number of people uh, who are speaking because of a book that has been edited with a number of chapters by each of these speakers. And so that's going to be um, be very interesting, be, be outstanding. So uh, look forward to, to that. That's December 9th, 7th through 9th. We have a few brochures here. And if you're interested in finding out more, you can go to the website pre-trib.org. That's pre-trib.org. How shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Jesus prayed to the Father, sanctify them in truth. Thy word is truth. For the grass withers and the flower fades, uh, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Before we get started, we'll have a few moments of silent prayer. We all need to constantly keep short accounts, make sure that we are walking by the Spirit. That is our lifestyle, that we are dependent upon God, the Holy Spirit. He is the one who's working in our life to produce spiritual growth and spiritual maturity. And so we'll have a few moments of silent prayer so you can confess sin if necessary, and then I will open in prayer. Let's pray. Father, I am reminded of the passage in Isaiah that says, Your ways are not our ways, and your thoughts are not our thoughts. And Father, it is difficult for us to comprehend who you are as you exist in yourself. And yet, Father, we know truth about you, because while we may not know you exhaustively, we can know you truly. And Father, we're thankful that you have revealed yourself to us and given us so 
uh, much information in your scripture, both propositionally as well as uh, evidence through the narratives, the stories, the episodes of scripture. And as we come to the close of our study of 2 Samuel, we pray that we might come to understand the significance of this final episode related to uh, judgment, but also of your grace in bringing David to the place where you would make your presence known and you would dwell there in the Holy of Holies, and this would be your dwelling place for over 300 years. Father, we pray that we might come to understand more about you as we study this. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. All right, let's open our Bibles to 2 Samuel. We are in 2 Samuel chapter 24, continuing what I talked, started on last time, God's grace and judgment. The judgment here is that uh, David will sin, but David's sin really is secondary to the fact that it is the sin of the people. Because as we read in verse 1 of chapter 24, again, the anger of the Lord was aroused against Israel. Doesn't start off against David, it is against Israel. And he moved David against them. And we talked about this last time that uh, God is using secondary means. It is David's whole volition to uh, determine to take this census. Now we have to understand what that's all about as well. But the fact that David's heart condemns him in verse 10, the fact that the parallel passage in uh, in uh, First Chronicles 21 speaks about Satan doing the movement. Well, we talked about all those things last week to pull that together. But this will be a judgment of God on Israel because of Israel's arrogance, David's arrogance. David and the people have, be, have failed the prosperity test. Uh, they've had this uh, tremendous prosperity under God's blessing, they have uh, experienced uh, the defeat of all of the enemies surrounding Israel. God has prospered them economically, and yet they have determined that they, that they don't really need God. They're acting like it, that, that all, we have, all we have is ours, and they act as if they did it themselves. And so this is the real sin that is taking place here, a sin of complacency, a sin of arrogance, a sin of, of self-sufficiency, and a, uh, a failure to recognize that it is all from the Lord. And so this comes at the end of Second Samuel. Now somebody asked me if I was going to go ahead and finish out the life of David. Well, I would if it was a life of David course, but it's not. It's a Samuel course. But if you want to listen to the end of David's life, which is given in the first two or three chapters in the um, first two chapters in 1 Kings, uh, I did a study about maybe 10 years ago now going through First and Second Kings. So you can pick that study up uh, and listen to the initial studies there to finish out the life of David. What we're going to do when we finish this chapter, because uh, the episode uh, doesn't really end here, David, as we'll see in just a minute, David writes a psalm that will be sung in the temple that will be built. And it is a dedication of the temple, even though he is not going to be alive uh, for the building of the temple because God said that that would be Solomon's responsibility. David has done everything that he can to provide for the building of it, as it were, David bought and supplied the temple building kit, and the only thing left is for Solomon to read the directions and put it together. Uh, David's uh, purchased all the lumber. He's made the deals with uh, uh, Hiram of Tyre. He's uh, got the gold. He has the jewels. He has the metal workers, the craftsmen, the carpenters, everybody in place. And they're just waiting for the Lord to take David home, and then Solomon will be the one uh, to build the temple. So with the establishment of the location, which occurs in the last part of this chapter, uh, David will now dedicate this. We, we think of you dedicating a building when they finish it. 
This is a dedication before they start it, and that's Psalm 30, as we will uh, see when we finish. So next time we'll come back and we'll finish up with that to tie everything together and then go from there on into a study of other psalms. So just to remind you, we're in this last part of... of, um, the last part of Second Samuel, where there are, for lack of a better term, term seven appendices. There are seven different things that are talked about. They are not a couple of them, like what happens in this chapter, occur at the end or near the end of David's life. But the others are talking about other events that occurred uh, during the time uh, of of David's reign over Israel, we talk about the origin, or excuse me, the organization of the kingdom, then the famine judgment because uh, there's this judgment because of the sin of the house of Saul, and so God that has to be made right. God's justice has to be taken care of because His righteousness has been violated. Uh, God shows His grace toward David in protecting him with the sword in uh, 21, 15 to 22. And then David is going to write a tremendous psalm, 2 Samuel 22, which is identical to Psalm 18. Uh, for about 99% of the words, there's a few things a little bit different. Uh, David's praise of Yahweh for his faithful deliverance. And then we see the flip side uh, with a, the parallels, and we'll, I'll put the diagram up again for the, for the chiasm. David's last testament in 2 Samuel 23, 1 through 7, reflects on the Davidic covenant and the privilege God has given him to write about the coming Messiah in the Psalms. It's poorly translated. I went through the details of the translation when we studied that, but there it makes it very clear. David is writing. He knows he's writing. He is self-consciously writing uh, these psalms uh, that are about the Messiah, and clearly he knows that he is writing prophecy. And then there's the, another long, cha- long section showing how God provided for David, protected David, through his mighty men, so that when God, when David says God delivered him, it doesn't always mean a direct deliverance, but indirectly through secondary means in terms of his army and his, his warriors. And then we come back to a second plague situation in 2 Samuel 24. So this puts us in a, in a chiasm where the center of the chi- chiastic structure uh, takes us uh, to the last verse in chapter uh, in chapter 20, uh, 22. And the last verse in 20, uh, 22 reads, He, that is God, is the tower of salvation to his king. It's reflecting on the uh, Davidic covenant. And shows mercy to his anointed, his Mashiach. That's the Hebrew word for an- anointed. To David and his descendants forevermore. So this then takes us to just understand a little bit more about the, the background that's going on here in 2 Sa- uh, Samuel 24, which I talked about last time, is what is this sin that is taking place here? Uh, the anger of the Lord is aroused against Israel. What is their sin? And he moved David against them. So David is guilty of uh, the sin as well, and then his, he, he goes about this numbering process, not because it, it in and of itself is a bad thing. The, the men in Israel were numbered when they came out of, of Egypt, when they were at Mount Sinai, before they went to uh, head to the promised land, before they uh, n- knew there would be Uh, 40 years in the wilderness, they numbered the men, and then they numbered them again 40 years later, the next generation, as they were about to enter into the uh, land that God had uh, given to them. And so this is, uh, this, this is a right thing. It's not something that's inherently wrong. It's not something that's immoral. It's not something that's sinful. What makes it sinful is David's mentality. It is a right thing done for a wrong reason. 
It's a right thing that is done uh, in a wrong way. And we have to recognize that. Today there's a lot of talk about Marxism because this seems to be the overarching worldview and, and uh, ec philosophical system of those who are creating so, so, such chaos today and destruction of power, which is just a standard playbook of Marxism to overthrow a government. And when you, when you understand, um, uh, understand Marxism, they operate on the principle that the end justifies the means. In other words, a right thing done in a wrong way for them is good. It doesn't matter. Uh, for them, methodology is neutral. So you, they reject the idea that there's a wrong way to accomplish their evil and nefarious schemes. But we as believers know that a right thing has to be done a right way. Uh, there's so much evangelism that's done a wrong way. It's a right thing done a wrong way. And there's a lot of things that go on in many churches that are right things, but they're done in wrong ways. They're not really trusting in the Lord. Uh, but because at, in many of these situations, God's word is present, God honors his word, not because of the people, not because they're doing anything uh, the right way, but just because God and his grace is uh, still going to use it and bless, bless his particular word. So the sin that is taking place here is this sin of self-sufficiency. It's a sin of arrogance. It's a sin of pride that they have somehow accomplished this all on their own. And so we go to a passage in Psalm 30, which we'll look at next time. But in the New King James, the way they translate the Hebrew is confusing. They translate it a psalm a song at the dedication of the house of David. Now that makes it sound like this is a dedication of the king's palace. When David built his palace, he built that, uh, that first, and then, he's gonna, uh, then the temple is built later. But that's not how it reads in the Hebrew. The Hebrew reads, as the NASB 95 translates it, as three distinct thoughts. The first is a psalm, a mizmor. And then it gives the purpose or the context for writing this psalm, a song at the dedication of Habait, the house. Okay, now that can be any house. It can be the house of the Lord or it could be an individual's house. And then in the Hebrew, you have one word, and in Hebrew, you, you connect prepositions to the word as a prefix, and it's le David. The la is in every one of the Psalms that David writes. It's, it's the letter Lamed in the Hebrew alphabet, and it is called or designated in Hebrew grammars as a Lamed Octoris, using the Latin title, the Lamed of authorship. It tells you who wrote the Psalm. So what we have is a mizmor, and then it states who wrote it, of David, but it puts it at the end, and this confused the King James translators. It is not a song at the dedication of the house to David. It is a, a psalm, a psalm of David, a song at the dedication of the house. So we'll see that this is clearly stated to be a psalm written not as a confession of sin, because he does re rehearse the fact that he sinned, and the psalm talks about the fact that he's gone through some horrible situation that uh, could have cost him his life. And so we'll go over that uh, when we get into it as to uh, what's going on there. But in Psalm 30, verse 6, he says, Now in my prosperity I said, I shall never be moved. And the word there that is translated uh, prosperity is a word that literally means at ease. When I had come to a point where everything in life was easy, I was no longer fighting any internal enemies. I was no longer fighting any rebels. I was no longer fighting external enemies. We had arrived. There's peace and prosperity in the kingdom. And David says, I, I can't be moved. I can't be shaken. 
I am on top of the world and nobody can knock me down. I've arrived. And he leaves God out of the equation. And so this designates for us exactly what his sin was, a failure to, uh, a failure to have um, uh, recognized that all that he had, everything that had been given to him, all the peace and prosperity that he had, uh, came from the hand of God. Now last time, as we got into this, we looked at the comparison of, of 2 Samuel 24.1 with uh, 1 Chronicles 21.1. And in the difference is that in 24.1 it says, the anger of Yahweh was aroused against Israel and he moved David. But in 1 Chronicles it says, Satan moved David against them. And I pointed out that, I'm not going to reteach that, that pointed out that God does not tempt anyone. James 1.13, let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. And so James states this as a universal principle. And what we see, and last time we looked at these passages in um, in uh, 1 Kings 26, looking at the passage dealing with uh, God uh, having a convocation of the angels in heaven, the sons of God, which includes both the elect angels as well as the fallen angels. And he, he asks a uh, question, who's going to go forth and deceive Ahab? Ahab and Jehoshaphat, as we saw, had allied themselves together. The king of Israel in the north is the wicked evil King Ahab, who was married to a very wicked woman, Jezebel, who had introduced not just idolatry into the northern kingdom, um, Jeroboam I introduced idolatry into the kingdom, but now she is going to introduce the horrors of fertility worship uh, into the kingdom into the northern kingdom. And uh, so she has all of her prophets of Baal and Asherah, and we've studied the whole situation at uh, Mount Carmel when Elijah, a prophet of Yahweh, challenges them. And they have done, a, they have just devastated the northern kingdom spiritually, and so now God is going to bring that to an end and bring this discipline uh, on Ahab and on Jezebel as a result of this battle. And so he sends a de deceiving demon. And all of this is wrapped around the idea that God, that Satan and the demons can do nothing without God's permission. They want to do this. God is not giving them ideas. They want to do this. God gives them permission uh, because he allows for volition and sin and evil to exist uh, in, the, uh, in human history. So we see the, the statement in this, in 2 Samuel 24, 1, the anger of the Lord is uh, aroused against Israel, he moves David, and this is a, pa a way of urging someone or enticing them to do something. Now, it doesn't mean he does it directly. See, people want to read that as God's doing this directly, but he's not. We look at 1 Chronicles 21, and God is doing it indirectly uh, through Satan. So Satan stood up against Israel and moved David to number Israel. And then what happens, what happens next? Uh, we also see this same kind of thing happening, happening in Job. So what happens next is what we see in Second uh, Samuel 24.1. Again, the anger of Yahweh was aroused against Israel. Israel. And I talked last time about how this is really an idiom. It means that the, right, that the righteousness of God has been violated, and now his justice uh, must uh, enter into the situation, and there must be discipline. There must be a judgment on the people. It is not that God is angry. Anger is a human emotion. God does not have human emotions. But in anthropopathisms, human emotions, which God doesn't actually possess, are attributed to him so that we can capture or get an idea of what is, what is happening and uh, what God is doing. And I always use the illustration of a courtroom. 
In a courtroom, you have a judge, and the judge sometimes is said to throw the book at the defendant, and nobody means literally that he throws the book at the defendant or that he even got angry because you want a judge that is going to be, uh, be steady and objective and is going to objectively and in a balanced way and accurate way apply the law. So this is just a figure of speech indicating the intensity of the judgment because of the violation of the righteousness of God. And whenever you have the words that are used here uh, together in, uh, in Hebrew, uh, it always results in a massive loss of life. This is serious. This is why you have uh, Jonathan Edwards' famous sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. This puts the, should put the fear of God into a person. And so this is, this is what happens. And in Exodus 22, 24, uh, there is a situation where Israel uh, has rebelled against God. And the text says, my wrath will become hot. Those are the words that are same words that are used in uh, 24, 1. Uh, my, my nose is burning. That's what it is, literally. Uh, my wrath will become hot, and I will kill you with the sword. Your wives shall be widows and your children fatherless. Second example is Israel has rebelled against God. This is the golden calf incident in 32.10. And God says to Moses, this is where he's saying, Moses, I'll kill all of them. And I will raise up a new nation through you, and uh, it's a test for Moses. And Moses passes the test, and he lays a case out for God not to do it. But in, say, in doing that, God says to Moses, Now therefore let me alone, that my wrath may burn hot. Literally, that my nose may turn red and burn hot against them, and I may consume them, them being everybody else in the nation and I will make of you a great nation. Numbers 11.1, 1, when the people complain and they uh, griped at, uh, against God, it displeased the Lord, for the Lord heard it, and his anger was aroused. It's the same phrase, same language. So the fire of the Lord burned among them and consumed some in the outskirts of the camp. So it was not a good idea a pleasant experience for Israel when they would hear that the anger of the Lord burned against them. And so right at the beginning of this chapter, we see the big red flags that something uh, bad is about to happen. Now, what takes place next is that uh, uh, the king is going to give orders to Joab to go count the people. So the king said to Joab, the commander of the army who was with him, now go throughout all the tribes of Israel from Dan to Beersheba and count the people that I may know the number of the people. Now, who's being counted here? When we look at this, it sounds like it's a regular census. In fact, we saw a census walker in the neighborhood today because this is a year when people are taking a census and you see all the advertisements on TV and just counting the people for all kinds of different reasons. But that's not what's going on here. How do we know that? Well, number one, he's, call he's not calling upon the uh, Census Bureau or the civilians to go count everybody. He calls upon his, his, uh, the general of his army he calls upon Joab and the officers who are with him, the, the top commanders in the army. So it's a military operation. Uh, second, we see that this lasts a long time. It's going to last over 300 days, lasts a better part of a year. And he's going to send them out. And then when all of it is, uh, is completed, in verse 9 we read and uh, that the total count is a valiant men. It's not counting the women. It's not counting the children. It's not counting those under the age of 20 or over the age of uh, 40. It's counting just those who are of uh, age so that if they need to have a draft, they find, know how many people they can, uh, they can call up so they know exactly how many, how many people uh, are there. So we know that the whole purpose of this 
is to count how many people uh, there, there are, how many military age men there are that can, uh, so they can field an army. Now, Joab is immediately, Joab questions this. Verse 3, Joab said to the king, Now may the Lord your God add to the people a hundred times more than they are, and may the eyes of my lord the king see it. But why does my lord the king desire this thing? Now, Joab is not a picture uh, uh, of, of uh, spiritual perspicacity. Joab is a violent warrior, and we've seen many times when he's out of control. But he recognizes we've defeated all of our enemies. The army is mostly a citizen army. They have some professional mercenaries, the Carathites and the Pelathites and a few others. But it's mostly a civilian army, and Joab is going, we're not fighting anybody. Nobody's threatening us. Everybody's been defeated. Why do we need to have a count of how many uh, potential soldiers we have in the country? So he's, he's tuning in that something's not right here. Something isn't going on uh, correctly. And so he is going to uh, question what David is doing and why he's doing it. And then David is going to come along in verse 4. We read, nevertheless, the king's word prevailed against Joab and against the captains of his army. So it's not just Joab. He's got all of his uh, commanders, all of his brigade commanders, all of his division commanders, uh, everybody coming together, and they're, they're questioning why should we, uh, why do we really need to do this? What we see is the problem is arrogance. And arrog a couple of quick principles to remember about arrogance. Arrogance is the root of all sins. Whatever sin you're committing, it's because you're arrogant. And what's going on with arrogance? Arrogance, first of all, is you're just self-absorbed. You're self-absorbed, and so you want to uh, indulge uh, whatever it is your sin nature wants. So you're self-indulgent. And then once you are self-indulgent, what happens? You have to justify it. So you're into self-justification. Uh, and you go through self-justification, and it's uh, paired with self-denial, and then it ends up with self-deification because you're going to control your life rather than, than God. So arrogance is the root of all sins, and second, arrogance is self-destructive. And when you have a nation that is arrogant, it's going to lead some, to some self-destructive policies. And this typically happens when a nation is in the prosperity test. No nation has ever passed the prosperity test. This nation failed the prosperity test after World War II and into the 50s and the 60s. And what's interesting there, and I've been doing some study on this, and at some time in the, uh, in the future coming months, we need to address this, what happens is coming out of World War II, in the midst of prosperity, there were people who had already turned against the United States, and a lot of them in academia. And so most people never knew this term in the 50s and 60s, but we had already turned a corner in this nation from what is known as modernism to postmodernism. Modernism led, modernism was the philosophy that came out of the Enlightenment. Modernism is the idea that on the basis of human reason and human exper experience, empiricism and reason, we can create a perfect world. It was a bastardized view of the kingdom from, from the Bible that somehow we can bring in the kingdom, we can bring in a utopic position, we can solve the problems. It, it, it is a kissing cousin to the foundation of Marxism and socialism. The idea that we can uh, create a paradise where every, there's pure equality, there is, quote, social justice, everything else. And so when that failed on the fields of Flanders in World War I, and you had these massive, massive deaths, and they weren't all due to war. More people died from disease and the horrors of trench warfare than they did from actual combat. Uh, it, it just, it, the, the optimism of the 
social gospel movement of the late 19th century just fell apart and led to pessimism. So we can't solve our problems with modernism and science, so how are we going to do it? So there's a rejection of reason, a rejection of empiricism as the tools needed to bring in a perfect environment. And so this gave rise to something called postmodernism. What comes after modernism? It's postmodernism, and everything becomes relative. There are no absolutes. Uh, reason can't get you anywhere, so we're just going to believe whatever we want to, no matter how irrational it is. Uh, we're going to reject rationalism and logic and reason, and that became part of postmodernism. And I've taught uh, a number of studies on postmodernism over the, over the last 20 years. What was the stepchild of postmodernism? A word you have heard a lot in just the last couple of weeks, but also in the last couple of months, and you don't know what in the world it's talking about, and it is the term critical theory. There's a critical legal theory, there's a critical race theory, there's critical who knows what else there is theory, but this comes as a brainchild of some uh, legal, very liberal leftist uh, liberal, legal scholars in the 1970s. And this now is, we, it's made the headlines uh, because President Trump very wisely uh, prohibited any more training in the federal government and federal government employees based on critical race theory. And it is the idea that it's not the individual, it doesn't matter what you've done, it doesn't matter what you haven't done, what matters is your race. And if you are white, then you are the most evil person in the world because you are the source of all, all racism and all that is uh, in the world due to oppression. And so what critical race theory does is it divides the world into two classes, the oppressors and the oppressed. And so the white people are the oppressors. And it doesn't matter if you are the poorest, dumbest, uh, hick in Appalachia, you have white privilege, and that's another part of it. You have white privilege, and so you are the oppressor, and what has to happen is that all these good things that the oppressors have really belong to the oppressed, and so it's just fine to go on these uh, looting rampages in these cities and to go into the finest stores and loot everything and burn it all down and everything because we're owed that from the oppressor. And it doesn't matter about the individual. Now, God never deals with people on the basis of their class. He doesn't deal with people in terms of groups. He deals with people in terms of what? Individual personal responsibility. So from the get-go, uh, critical race theory denies personal responsibility. It's it just pure, pure Marxism in that way. And so this is self-destructive. That's what it's going to do. And it's all grounded in arrogance and a rejection of God's word. And so we're going to hear a lot more about, now I'm not talking about from me, but we're going to hear more and more of this in the coming uh, coming weeks. This is why you as a white person uh, can't, uh, are a racist, but if you're in a, a member of an oppressed class, it's impossible for you to be a racist because a racist is no longer identified as an individual who harbors bigoted beliefs against people of a different race. Uh, racism is being a part of the oppressor group and by definition, you are a racist if you're white, and so you have to repent of that, and you have to uh, do various things to somehow get, get uh, cultural credits, and that's why you see so many uh, different white people bending the knee and giving in to Black Lives Matter and all these other groups because it's going to get them uh, brownie points so that they can avoid being part of the oppressor class. And that pretty much uh, explains all of it. It all comes from arrogance. And the third point is that arrogance is tenacious. Arrogance, it, 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 ar arrogance cloaks itself in the, in the good words of humility, and so it hangs on. And the fourth thing about arrogance is it destroys objective thought. And we see this in David. 
Uh, David just doesn't listen to, his, uh, to Joab. He doesn't listen to his commanders. He just presses on. Arrogance is tenacious. And he doesn't respond to their logical arguments and their questions because uh, objective thought gets destroyed under arrogance. And then the fifth thing is that in the book of Proverbs, it equates arrogance with foolishness. Foolishness leads to failure. And it's the role of the parent to train the children because children, uh, Proverbs says, foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child and the rod of correction. And that's a term and not only includes corporal punishment, but it's the idea that the parent's responsibility is to teach and train children not to be foolish, to teach them wisdom, to teach them these skills uh, so that they can live a wise life based on humility and not a foolish life based on uh, self-absorption and arrogance. So this is the problem that uh, Israel has. It's a problem David has, and God is going to bring this judgment on them to humble them uh, under his omnipotence, under his, under his power. So we see that, uh, that this is all related to building up the military, look at what, what we've done, and look at who we are. This isn't any different today than what we see in our culture. You have sports teams, sports celebrities. Some of these people make millions and millions. It's, it's almost nauseating how many millions of dollars are thrown at some of these athletes. And their IQs aren't much better than room temperature. Now, some of them are quite bright, but for the vast majority, they're, they're not all that bright, but they do play well, and they, are, they have great a- athletic skills, uh, but they, and they know their game. And then we have celebrities. We have those who are uh, tremendously talented in uh, music and acting and many things, and we enjoy watching them do those things, and we enjoy the movies they're in, and we enjoy the television shows that they're in. But that doesn't give them a platform for being very uh, uh, smart in any other area of life. But we've been trained for the last 50 years through television that we, advertisements come on and you have some uh, celebrity, some actor or actress gets up there and they talk about how wonderful this toothpaste is. Well, because we like them as an actor, now they must know something about toothpaste. They haven't been to dental school and they don't know anything about teeth and they don't know anything about toothpaste, but we've given them credibility. And so now we have a situation where they come out and they start telling us, uh, how things ought to be in terms of, of politics, in terms of policy, in terms of uh, social living, all of these things. And, and they don't have any framework for doing that. And yet we have, we have given them all this credit over the last uh, 50 years or so, and it's nothing more than arrogance. And so we're reaping what we have, uh, what we have sown, and this is what's, what's destroying the nation. So we come to verse 5, and we're, we're given the travel log of these uh, census takers. They're out counting all of the men of military age in Israel. And we read, they crossed over the Jordan and camped in Ora Air uh, on the right side of the town, which is in the midst of the ravine of Gad and toward uh, Jazer. Then they came to Gilad and to the land of Tatim Hadshi. They came to Dan Ja'an and around to Sidon, and they came to the stronghold of Tyre and all the cities of the Hivites and the Canaanites. Then they went to South Judah as far as Beersheba. When they had gone through all the land, they came to Jerusalem at the end of nine months and 20 days. So this is a, a three-fourths of the year, nine months. They had a solar calendar of, of, 30, uh, of 30 days, so that's uh, 270 days, uh, so it's 290 days in all, so they only have about 70 days left or two months left in the year. Now here's a map, so you, we know what they've done. Down here, right at this point, is Beersheba. And up here at the north, just off the map would be, our, wait a minute, excuse me, here's Dan right here. So we have Dan here, and Beersheba down here. And Israel had land in the Negev, which is south of Beersheba, but it wasn't inhabited. 
And then there's uh, a little bit of settlement up north of Dan, up in this area. But this became an idiom in Israel. Uh, the furthermost northern settlement is Dan. The southernmost is Beersheba. And so Dan to Beersheba is all of Israel. It'd be like saying from Beaumont to El Paso. And that would refer to all of Texas or from Brownsville to Amarillo. Uh, so that, that's the idea. And, and what happens is they leave Jerusalem, cross over here uh, to the, here is uh, Gilad. And so the Gad's territory is just uh, the border somewhere right around here. And they come to that southern border that is between Gad and the Ammonites. And then they work their way north and they come up and they cross over the area. Here's the Sea of Galilee. They cross over the Galilee. Here's Tyre, and um, and where I can't see where Sidon is. I uh, can't read that map from this far away. But it, Sidon is right in this area. So they come over to the area around Phoenicia, where the Canaanites live, and then they head south along the Mediterranean and go through the uh, uh, the plains, uh, the coastal plains of of uh, the Shephela. And then they go all the way down to Beersheba, and then they finally get back to Jerusalem. So they've taken the grand tour, gone through all the tribes, and counted up the people. And in 1 Chronicles 21.4, we read, Nevertheless, the king's word prevailed against Joab, therefore Joab departed, went throughout the land. And then Joab gave the sum of the number of the people to David. All Israel had 1,100,000 men who drew the sword. Now, that's your first clue that that's what they're counting, is how many, how many warriors they can muster. 1,100,000 men who drew the sword, and Judah had 470,000. So how many people do you have? You have 1,100,000, and 400,000 is 1,570,000. Well, that's not what Samuel says, and there's some corruption, as I've said several times in the study, that Samuel is one of the most uh, corrupt uh, manuscripts that we have, where there's, there's, uh, it usually affects things like numbers and age and a few things like that. And so this is what we see. They, they count everybody, so they have a sizable army, and this number uh, actually fits uh, with a similar number of how many warriors they had, how many men of fighting age they had uh, at the beginning of the book of Numbers and at the end of the book of Numbers. Now, one of the things that gets uh, some uh, confusion if you are studying the Bible and you're reading uh, along with uh, in a commentary or something and they may uh, begin to talk about uh, these numbers, that we really can't count on these numbers, that the number for a thousand, and we'll run into this again when it says 70,000 were killed, really refers to some undetermined uh, number of people, a military unit of, some say, uh, like a battalion. We don't know exactly how many were in it, but it's not really, uh, should not be taken as a literal 1,000 people. Now, the problem with that is Scripture. We always have to let Scripture interpret Scripture. And um, I've, I've run into this problem since I was in seminary because I had Old Testament professors that said, yeah, it's just not reasonable to think that there were this many people living in Israel when they came out of, out of Egypt, that they had three and a half, uh, two and a half to three million people crossing the desert, well, here's how you figure it out using Scripture. In Exodus 38:25, they're taking up the temple tax, and that's a head tax. So everybody had to give a half shekel. Okay, that's the temple tax. And so Exodus 38:25 says, and this is when they're collecting silver for the tabernacle. And the silver from those who were numbered of the congregation was 100 talents, and 1,775 shekels. So that's going to come out. We'll work the math on that in just a minute. According to the shekel of the sanctuary. Now, that's an important phrase because it tells you they had an exact standard. 
for how much a shekel was. Uh, verse 26, a beka for each man, that is half a shekel. So we know that the temple tax is a half a shekel. And then it, it says at the conclusion there, for everyone included in the numbering from 20 years old and above for 603,550 men. That's not women and children, just men. 600, uh, 603,550 men. Now, then Numbers 232 said, These are the ones who were numbered of the children of Israel by their father's house. All who were numbered according to their armies of the forces were 603,550. So it's the same number in both, both passages. Now, the way we figure this up is that 100 talents plus 1,775 shekels is going to equal 301,775 shekels. One talent, which was a, a monetary device, is worth 3,000 shekels. So it's pretty simple. You just multiply 3,000 times 100, you get 300,000 uh, shekels, and add it to 1,775, and you get 301,775 shekels. So that's how much they took up in their offering. Now, if, a, if the temple tax is a half a shekel, how do you figure out how many people there were? Well, you multiply 301, 775, 301,775, you multiply it by two, and you get 603,550. That's exactly the number that they have in Exodus 3826 and Numbers 232. And that tells you that a thousand means a thousand. It doesn't, it's not a unit, a military unit, or something else like that. So we can uh, trust those numbers rather than our uh, corrupted common sense. So David sends them out. They go out, and they come back, and they give their report of how many there are in, in the land. And instantly what happens? David comes under conviction. He knows he sinned. He knows this was wrong. His whole attitude was one of self-sufficiency and that this shows God's blessing on the nation. God's the one who's done this. And David is convicted. In verse 10 we read, And David's heart condemned him after he had numbered the people. So David said to the Lord, I have sinned greatly in what I have done, but now I pray, O Lord, take away the iniquity of your servant, for I have done very foolishly. Now, this is an important statement here. David says, number one, he says, I've sinned greatly. I have sinned greatly. He never used the adverb greatly when he confessed his sin with Bathsheba. This is a sin uh, of arrogance. It is much worse than the overt sin. See, in, in, in America, due to uh, the, the heritage of of the Victorians, we think that every bad sin has something to do with sex, but it, it doesn't. It's arrogance. This is so much, so much worse. And so uh, David recognizes this, and his heart has convicted, convicted him of his self-sufficient uh, arrogance. And he not only adds the adverb here, greatly, but he then goes on to say, that he has done very foolishly, not just foolishly, but very foolishly. And this is another uh, interesting word. This is the word sakel, which means to be foolish. And it's used in a couple of interesting places. For example, in 1 Samuel 13, 13, we read, And Samuel said to Saul, You have done foolishly. Now, this is when Saul did not kill the Amalekites, did not annihilate them as God told him to, and he left the Amalekite king, um, Agag, left him alive. And Samuel says, you've done foolishly, you have not kept the commandment of the Lord your God. That means that when you don't obey God, you're acting the fool. You have not kept the commandment of the Lord your God, which he commanded you. For now the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel uh, forever. And then later on, we have this situation in uh, 1 Samuel uh, 
2621, then Saul said to David, after he's caught trying to kill David again, I have sinned, return my son David, for I will harm you no more, because my life was precious in your eyes this day. Indeed, I have played the fool and erred exceedingly. Now remember, in, in the first case, in 1313, this is the sin that leads to the, uh, Saul losing the kingdom. This is a hor- horrible sin. He's sinned, and he's done very foolishly. Now he, he expands on that. He's acted the fool and erred um, exceedingly. So David is, is using this same language in his confession. And he is saying that, he, that in verse 10, he says, I have done this, uh, uh, the iniquity of your, your, your servant, for I have done very, very foolishly. And now he has to con- be faced with the consequences. That goes back to divine institution number one. We are going to be held accountable for the decisions we make. We're held accountable in life by the negative consequences that come from bad decisions. And in some cases, God adds divine, uh, divine discipline and divine judgment. And so God sends his prophet. Remember, David isn't just a king like any other king. David is God's man for God's people. Uh, He has a special anointing from God, which no other king in the world has, and he has violated uh, God's character and God's law. And Gad is the successor to Nathan. Nathan was the prophet who confronted David with his sin with Bathsheba, and now Gad is going to come and confront David with this sin. And so... Uh, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Gad and said, Go and tell David, thus says the Lord, I offer you three things. You get to pick your discipline. Now, nothing good's going to come next. There are three things that are brought up. First of all, choose, uh, he has to choose one of them yourself. And so Gad said to David and told him, Shall se- you have three choices, seven years of famine, or you are going to be chased for three months by your enemies. And then the third is three days of plague. What are you going to do? Now, this is a tough decision because in three months of, um, or three years of famine, that's going to hurt everybody in the land. And it's going to make the, the, the long-term consequences are going to be terrible for the nation. They're going to be vulnerable for years. It's going to wreck their economy. Uh, or three months of military defeat and pursuit, a lot of people will die. And there are going to be many other horrible things that happen in war. There's just terrible things that happen in war. And it would also lead to a loss of morale in the nation. And in three days of pl- plague... Uh, people will die. You know, it's going to be a, uh, not, maybe not as great a number. Uh, it's only three days. But David, notice David doesn't make the decision. He's going to throw himself on the mercy of God. Verse 14, I am in great distress. Please let us fall into the hand of the Lord, for his mercies are great. But do not let me fall into the hand of man. So he is going to, he says, the military option's bad. I'll, I don't want to fall into the hand of man. Uh, I don't want to uh, deal with a famine. So we're just going to let God make up the decision. So the Lord chooses the third option. He sent a plague upon Israel from morning till the appointed time. Now, we don't know what the plague was. It, it probably wasn't COVID-19. It, was, uh, it could have been anything. Smallpox. There were a number of plagues in the ancient world related to smallpox, uh, some uh, recurrences, the bubonic plague, the Black Death, things of that nature. But this is a quick-moving uh, uh, plague over a period of, uh, of three days. And we're told from, from uh, Dan to Beersheba, 70,000 men of the people died. And it says men. It doesn't say women and children. So that suggests that if the count is men who are military age and the issue is how many men can you put in the field for a battle, 
then the, those who are died, the 70,000 men, are 70,000 of your potential soldiers. So God's discipline targets, targets the people who are involved in the sin. Their, their arrogance, the military's thinking, we've got it made, we can, we can beat anybody. So in verse 16, here I'm, I want to look at the passage, the parallel passage in, um, in, in Chronicles. But what we're told in 24.16, when the angel stretched out his hand over Jerusalem to destroy it, the Lord relented from the destruction. So it came close to Jerusalem, but it didn't touch Jerusalem. And the Lord uh, said to the angel who was down destroying the people, it's enough, now restrain your hand. And the angel of the Lord was by the threshing floor of Aruna the Jebusite. Now, what's going on here? Well, first of all, there are three things that stop the plague. First of all, it was God's mercy. Secondly, it is David's intercession for his people. It wasn't about him, but he, pray, he puts it in the, in the hands of the Lord and calls upon him to be merciful. And then third, it's God's love for Jerusalem. Again and again through the Psalms, God loves Jerusalem. God loves Zion. God loves the gates of Zion. Over and over again, God loves Jerusalem. That is his city. And so he stays his hand. Now, 1 Chronicles 21, 15, and 16 uh, describes it this way. And God sent an angel to Jerusalem to destroy it. As he was destroying, the Lord looked and relented of the disaster. So he gets right to the city limits, and then God stops him and said to the angel who was destroying, it's enough, now restrain your hand. And the angel of the Lord stood by the threshing floor of Ornan. And the Chronicles calls him Ornan. There's one letter difference in the Hebrew, and it's transliterated into English. It's that U that you have there, but it's probably... Uh, it was probably silent. There was something that they did in the Hebrew language to create a, uh, th originally didn't have any vowels, and so they would uh, create a vowel using uh, the vav and using the, the yud as a, as, a, um, uh, as a vowel. And so that, that sort of corrupted the name. So it's probably, um, it, it starts the same, it's probably Ornan is much closer to the original way it would have been spelled. And then David lifted his eyes and saw the angel of Yahweh, the pre-incarnate Lord Jesus Christ, standing between heaven and earth, having in his hand a drawn sword stretched out over Jerusalem. And we've seen this imagery, the sword, the flaming sword of the cherubs surrounding the Garden of Eden, and um, uh, the power of the sword is given to the government in Romans 13. This is a, a, an indication, a metaphor for the power of life and death. Has a drawn sword stretched out over Jerusalem. So David and the elders clothed in sackcloth fell on their faces. So that is the scenario. And then what does David say? Verse 17, Then David spoke to the Lord when he saw the angel who was striking the people and said, Surely I have sinned. He, he, the people have sinned, but David, David takes responsibility. He's not going to pass the buck like Adam did in the garden. He said, I have sinned and I have done wickedly. What did he do? He was arrogant. He thought he, he had pulled this thing off all by himself. And so this isn't nearly as bad as what most people think of as horrible sins. Today we live in a world where it's racism or it's genocide. These are indeed horrible things. But what God looks at is the heart that is deceptive and wicked above all things and as arrogant as it can be. That is worse because that's the root of all sin. Surely I have sinned and I have done wickedly, but these sheep, what have they done? What have these people do? Let your hand, I pray, be against me and against my father's house. So what happens is they come to Jerusalem. And here is a, an artist rendition, a model of the ancient city of David. Uh, you're standing basically, the, the, it's an aerial, but you're toward the north and you're looking uh, toward the south. And this area up here at the top was the area that had been the threshing floor of Aruna the Jebusite. 
And then below this, you would have had David's palace down here, the palace of the king. And then this is the city. And it doesn't look very big in, in the model, and it's not. Because people didn't live in the city. The only people who would have lived in the city were the, uh, were the bureaucrats, were the administrators of the kingdom. Uh, people lived on their land. They lived on their farms. And only the people who were uh, part of the government uh, would have lived in Jerusalem itself. But I want to show you a couple of things here. This gives you an idea. But this land at the top, notice it's, it's very rugged, it's very uneven, but that's the Temple Mount today. That is Mount Moriah, where Abram had taken Isaac to sacrifice him, and that is where the current te Temple Mount is today. It's something like uh, 23 acres. I never can remember what the exact number is, but it's, it's like 23 acres. And it looks huge today, but at that time, it was just a, the, uh, sort of a knobby hill. Here's another uh, picture of seeing the size of, of, uh, and the scale of the, the city. It's not very big. This is the old Jebusite city. And it, it, it's taking time after David into the time of Solomon where they began to spread out uh, to go uh, west of the city and to go uh, into the area to the northwest and to the north on the other side of the, of the Temple Mount. But this gives you an idea at the time of David, it's this, this somewhat flat area at the top where you would have a threshing floor because a threshing floor had to be an area that would catch the wind because you bring in the grain, you have threshing uh, forks, winnowing forks, that you toss the grain up in the air and the uh, wind blows the chaff away. And so this is where, where it would take place. And in Israel, all threshing floors would, were considered to be holy. They're set apart to God because it is where you realize the bounty of God's provision uh, for your life. All the production in a country at that time was in agriculture. And so this is an indication of God's blessing for the people. And so uh, a threshing floor was a, uh, was a holy place. And this is where they would beat and crush uh, the grain in order to separate it from the chaff, separate the edible uh, portion. So it was usually a level outdoor area where the wind could blow and uh, help in the uh, help in the in the process. And so that's quite a bit different when you look at that than in this picture, which is a model. The Jeru uh, it's the model of the first century city of Jerusalem at the time of D David. But this is what Herod's temple looked like. Because what happened is, over the course of time, uh, they built the first temple, and then that was destroyed, and that's on just this, this hilly hill, hilltop there. And then they, uh, it was destroyed by the, by the Babylonians. They came back and they rebuilt the temple, but it, didn't, it wasn't as large and it wasn't as spectacular as Solomon's temple. And that's what we refer to as the second temple temple. And then Herod, who was the great builder and architect, decides he's going to rebuild the temple. Now, some people get the idea this is a third temple. The reason it's not a third temple is the sacrifices never stopped. It is a complete remodeling of the temple, the temple that Zerubbabel built. And so he is going to build this, and it was so spectacular, it was considered the eighth wonder of the ancient world. And the, the rabbis and the Pharisees say, if you've never seen beauty until you've seen Jerusalem. And it was, it was just phenomenal. And so in verse 18 we read, uh, Gad now comes to give uh, direction to David. Notice, David isn't having inner impressions. He isn't getting liver quiver. He isn't getting some sort of feeling that God wants him to do this. He is getting objective direction, objective revelation from Gad, who says, go up, erect an altar to the Lord on the threshing floor of Aruna the Jebusite. 
So David does according to the word of the Lord, and Aruna is looking on, and he is a believer as well. And he sees the king and his servants coming. He goes out very respectful. He bows down to, uh, to, to David and asking why he's there. And David says, I want to buy the threshing floor from you and build an altar to the Lord that the plague may be withdrawn from the people. And Aruna is very generous. He says, no, 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 let me give it to you. Let me give it to you, and let me give you the land, and I will give you the oxen for the sacrifice and everything. But David, David is grace-oriented, and grace-oriented doesn't always mean you accept a gift because David recognizes that if this sacrifice, because it's a sacrifice, doesn't cost him something, it's not significant. And so uh, David, uh, uh, David rejects this. He says, no, but I will buy it from you for a price. Nor will I offer burnt offerings to the Lord my God with that which costs me nothing. That's the I picture of a burnt offering is that everything belongs to the Lord. And so it is at personal cost. I'm giving up my selfish desires and will serve the Lord. So David bought the threshing floor, the oxen for 50 shekels of silver and built there an altar to the Lord and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings So the Lord heeded the prayers for the land, and the plague was withdrawn from Israel. That's the grace of God. This establishes the place where the temple will be built. Now, I want to show you a video in just a minute. Some of you who have been to Israel will recognize it. But I wanted to play this. I took a video of it. Barb took a video of it. The light and the sound just wasn't uh, up to speed. But um, uh, So we found one on the Internet that does, does a pretty good job. And so we're, I'm going to show this so you get an idea of, of a general idea of the, the history here and the, the, uh, tran- uh, the transition. So this is, uh, let me see, Barb, you're going to get the lights, thanks. Now we have a, an Israeli guide, he's got an accent, so I'm going to turn the uh, sound off. And I'm just going to talk about what he's talking about so you'll get an idea of what's going on. Okay, so this is the model right here. And you have a valley going on this west side of the Temple Mount. And this valley over here is the Kidron Valley. And the valley over on this side was called the Valley of the Cheesemakers. Now, today you don't have a valley there because it's all been uh, leveled and it's all been um, uh, filled in. But what he's pointing out there is this center part of the what would have been uh, Aruna's uh, threshing floor, that's Mount Moriah. This is where Abram, Abraham brought Isaac to sacrifice him. And it's just part of the rugged, hilly, rocky terrain. There's nothing special about it. It has to be uh, leveled out, and this happens over time. So initially, what he's pointing out here, when they came back, they build a temple, the Zerubbabel's temple, and it's rather modest, and they build that in, uh, in the middle. Now, when Herod comes along... He's got to, he's going to really build this. He has huge uh, plans for what he's going to do in building this temple, but he's got to build a platform that will support the weight of the temple and so that it won't cause the ground to shift or any of these, uh, any of these other things. So first he had to level it, and so this is really nice. It took him uh, three or four years just to cut this out of the stone and carve this. And this line there on the west side, that is the area known as the Western Wall. So this this platform is what is built by by, uh, Herod the Great. And it's surrounded by a retaining wall. Now, the retaining wall is not part of the buildings of the temple. So when you go to the Western Wall, what's called the Wailing Wall, that's on the west side. And that was a retaining wall. It was not part of the temple structure. So when Jesus said none of these stones will uh, stay one stone on top of another on the temple buildings, he's not talking about the retaining wall. He's talking about the, uh, the language is very precise. He's talking about 
the, uh, the retaining wall and see that area where he's pointing right there, that's the section that we see today called the Western Wall. Now, you can go into what is called the Western Wall Tunnels, which is where the group is, where this model is, the entry into these tunnels, where you can walk along uh, the, the walls where they exist today. They've excavated all of that, and you'll see, I've shown you pictures before where they have uh, one particular stone. They've estimated it at around 460 tons, something like that, that they moved into place. And so then Herod builds uh, the, his, uh, rebuilds the temple, remodels it, and this becomes the temple at the time of Jesus. They only completed it in the mid-40s. Jesus is crucified in 33. They don't uh, complete it. Actually, it was never completed, but they stop work on it somewhere in the mid, uh, in the mid-40s. And so this gives you a view of what the Temple Mount looked like uh, in Jesus' time. It goes all the way back to Genesis 22, the sacrifice of uh, the sacrifice of Isaac. So that gives you a good little rundown, and you get to see that. So Vance, if you hit those lights over there on the wall, or, or Barb, then we can turn the lights on, and and uh, I'll close in prayer. Father, thanks for this opportunity to look at these things, to understand a little bit more about your will. That it's not. Uh, something we can fully comprehend or understand, but we know that you work out your plans and purposes. You are ultimately uh, in control. You give permission to Satan, uh, for example, to sift us, as it was state, Jesus stated, related to Peter, uh, to test us, as with Job and also with David here. And we see often that we fail. Uh, Job held out for a long time, and then he failed uh, we see the failure of David here. We see that uh, Peter failed and he uh, turned against the Lord or he denied knowing him. And Father, we pray that we might stand firm. We have the Holy Spirit. We have your word. But we have hearts of flesh and that are still sinful. And so, Father, we pray that we might come to understand that we're desperately in need of your grace every single day. And without that, we do not stand. And Father, challenge us with all these things in Christ's name. Amen.